So let's begin our review of the Part B2 and Part C of this June 2022 Regents Chemistry exam. So let's be crazy and start in order with the first question in this part. And it says, state the number of electrons in an atom of lithium-7. So lithium-7 and a number after it. So when we have a lithium-7 right here, what they're trying to tell us is that we have a lithium atom who has a mass of 7. They're talking about a specific isotope of lithium. And because it's lithium, it has, of course, atomic number of 3. That's what makes it lithium. So very important that we understand that 7 is not protons. It's the mass number. And why do we give the mass number? Because every atom has multiple forms of the same atom, which is called isotopes. Now, what, do you mean, what does it mean to have multiple forms of the same atom? Well, in the case of the diagram here, they're giving us lithium-6 and they're giving us lithium-7. These are both lithium, which means they both have the atomic number 3, and more importantly, okay, they have different mass numbers. That top number is the mass number, which you should know is to be protons and neutrons. So, in any case, to understand how many electrons are in an atom, the first thing I say to my students is, well, what is an atom? And I always say, if I say atom, you say neutral. Atom, you didn't say it, okay? But you're supposed to say neutral. Why does that help us? Because it reminds us that atoms don't have a charge, which means the protons, which is the bottom number here, it's the social security number, a guy named Charlie Buckle always said that to me, social security number of the atoms. So this is the proton number. And we know that means every proton is, pos is, is positive one, so the nuclear charge, or the positive part of the nucleus, or the, I should say the nucleus, is positive three because of the three protons which means we have to have what? An equal number of electrons. Each electron is negative one, so we would need three of them for a total of negative three. So we should know that the protons equal the electrons always in an atom. That's so important, okay? So all they wanted you to know was, do you know that lithium is atomic number three? And do you know that lithium, of course, has three electrons because if it's an atom, the protons must equal the electrons. So in any case, the answer here is just three. And you can put that right into your uh, answer booklet. And let's go there to our answer booklet. All right, and here we go. And we take our answer booklet and we put just three. All right, very simple, okay? Three. All right, so that's all that is to it. Again, now, if you didn't know, if you didn't know that lithium, okay, is atomic number three, all right, then we would go to the reference table, and specifically the periodic table. And there it is in all of its glory, right? There is the atomic number three right there, right? So in any case, atomic number three is that biggest, baddest, boldest number on the periodic table, okay? And it tells us the number of protons. And every unique element has a unique symbol, unique capital letter, with a either by itself or with a lowercase, and it has a unique number of protons. So that's all they wanted you. They, they wanted they wanted you to fall for lithium seven to be seven protons. No, they need to tell you the mass because the mass can be different, but the proton number cannot be. Number fifty-two. Compare the energy of an electron in the first shell of lithium atom to the energy of an electron in the second shell. All right, if we use the Bohr model, okay, to do this, okay, what we'll do here is we'll put our nucleus, and just to keep things accurate, we'll have three protons. Each proton is positive one. And, of course, we're going to have some neutrons, but that neutron number can be different, right? Because if we're lithium-7, we're going to have three protons and four neutrons, right? Because four plus three is seven, and a neutron and a proton have the same mass. If you don't know that, okay, then, so I'm drawing a lithium-7 nucleus, all right? If you don't know that neutrons and protons have the same mass, I go to table O. Now, let's put in the shells. Now, the shells of electrons, okay, we can think of them as orbits. They're not really orbits, but they're based upon proximity or distance. So we can use this analogy. This would be the first shell, 
and this would be the second shell. And we know that there's only two shells because if you look at lithium and the periodic table, you'll see this 2-1. And what that means is there are two electrons, and let's put them in color cord. There are two electrons in the, oh, uh, let's do it this way. There are two electrons, there's one, there's two, in the first shell, and there's one electron in the outermost shell. Now, electrons that are closer to the nucleus are the number in front. You can always think of the nucleus is right in front. Okay, now, how do I remember that which one is higher and lower energy? Well, when we remember that, if you're closer to the nucleus, that's the earlier, sh that's the earlier number or shell, you are closer to these positive protons. Remember, the nucleus is very positive and very small. So it's got a high charge density and it attracts electrons. So the closer you are to these electrons, the more you're controlled. You can't move much. So we would say that in this scenario here, that we would have low energy closer to the nucleus. And farther away, you have higher energy. Okay, so the first shell has lower energy and the outermost has higher. Now, what we, now, why would the outermost have higher energy? Well, the best way to think about this is electrons that are farther away can't feel this positive charge. You must think in your mind that positives attract negatives. But if the distance gets bigger, it's harder for these positives and negatives to attract each other. So these, this electron that's farther away is more freer. The best analogy I say is if you go to school with your mom and dad or your mom or dad, and they sit next to you all day long. Not saying you're going to act, you know, a lot less different, but I'm sure you're going to act a little bit different if your mom wants to, or dad goes to school with you all day. But if they don't go to school and they're farther away, you're probably going to act a little bit different, more freer, have a little more energy possibly. Okay, uh, any case. So outermost electrons are higher energy. They're also the valence electrons too, and they're available for bonding. So that's all that is. We can go to the answer booklet and see what we, what we put there. So the answer is very simply, the first shell has lower energy than the second shell. You could say that the second shell has higher energy than the first shell. So many different ways to say the same thing, but that would be the correct response. On to number 53. Number 53, show a numerical setup for calculating the atomic mass of the element lithium. Okay, so this is the weighted mass problem. You see this in your multiple choice section, especially from 31 through 50. And of course, we see it in part two. They just want to set up. So all we're going to do here is find 7.59% of this isotope's actual atomic mass. And then we're going to add it to the 92.41% of 7.101 of that mass of that isotope. So I'm going to find um, the first one here I'm going to do. Okay, so I'm going to find... 7.5% uh, of that atomic mass of that isotope. So I'm going to take 6.015. And of course, I'm going to multiply that to find the percentage. Now, when I do that, I move the decimal place two times. Don't forget that. So that becomes 0.0759. And that's how I do that, right? Finding a percentage of something, we take that percentage and we move the decimal point over and we're gonna add that result, this is called a weighted average, to the percentage or the weight of this, okay? So we're gonna take the 7.016, that's the actual mass of the isotope, experimental, and or the known, I should say, and then we're gonna times that by, um, move the decimal point two places, so that's 0.9241, and that's how we would do the setup. They don't require the answer. And you can see because the weight is higher for the lithium-7 isotope, our answer should be closer. And that's why if you go to reference table, it'll round off to 7, the most abundant isotope. Remember, this weighted average considers the percentages of the natural occurring isotopes of lithium and we average together, using those percentages, all of the, what, isotopes that exist. All right, so that's what this is. And we would have to put this into the answer booklet. And we'll do so now. And there it is. So remember, I'm writing these answers 
like on the worksheet or on the questions of the test, but I have to put my answers in the answer booklet on the real day. So that's why I'm, I'm kind of reinforcing that. So on to 54. Number 54 is given a graph and some information, and different teachers will teach you different ways to attack these part twos. I don't like my students getting intimidated, okay? So I tend to tell my, to my students to read the question first and then go back to the information they give us. Sometimes the questions are really, really straightforward and have nothing to do with the data given, all right? But in any case, I'm going to read the question, and then we'll go back anyway to see what's given, all right? So 54 states, state the general trend for the atomic radius of the first seven atoms in period three when considered in order from left to right. Now, this is something they could ask in the multiple choice section. You don't need a graph for this. You should understand that the general trend for atomic radius or ionization energy or electronegativity, okay, or density or melting points or boiling points, all of those things are in table S. It's the most underutilized table. People don't for, people forget to go there for all those things. So you don't have to actually know the trends. You can just look up every element, um, every element in the first seven elements of the periodic table and see how they change. Now, they're giving you this in a graph right here. They're giving you the radius and the element. We can see as the element, okay, increases in its atomic number across period three, right? That's row three. Don't forget that. It's going essentially down. So they're giving us that, but they don't have to because I can do this question without the information given. But let's go read the information on top so we can see what we're doing. Here's a graph below. And, and, and they're saying that we're basing our answers on 54 and 56 on this, okay? So the graph represents atomic radius of elements of period three. So again, it's nice to give me that, but I don't really need it because I already have this in table S. But in any case, they want the general trend, okay, for the first seven elements. And so consider from left to right. And it, you can say as we go across, and if you're not sure, go to the periodic table, and you can see this is atomic number 11, and this is in period three, which is row three. And it's, it reads just like this, sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, all the way to argon, the noble gas. Okay, so what do you think the trend is? The trend is, as the atomic number increases, okay, or as we go from left to right, the, generally speaking, now we said trend. Trend means the general change. You notice there might be some instances where the trend isn't exactly followed. But generally speaking, as the, if you look at the entire data, from um, sodium to argon, it generally does go down. It's important you realize that. All right, so let's get our answer to the answer booklet because we can see the trend is very simply the radius is decreasing as we move across from left to right in period three. And here we are at the answer booklet, and I write the atomic radius generally decreased. I use the word generally, but you don't have to. I'm saying because it's a trend, decreases as as from left to right across period three. So as we move across period three, uh, from sodium to uh, argon there, uh, obviously the trend was a decrease. You can just probably just say, you could honestly just write decrease, right? They'll accept that, all right? Because they're looking for the trend. The trend is that there's a decrease in atomic radius, and that would be, that'd be suffice to say that as well. So on to number 55. Number 55, state in terms of valence electrons. It is so vital that you guys answer the questions as they ask them. They're directing you by saying, in terms of valence electrons, they want you to answer in terms of them. So if you answer this question correctly, but don't answer it with the understanding of some kind of valence electron concept, okay, then it won't be right. So please, if you have to reread, they're directing you how to answer this, all right, which actually is actually a big clue here, okay? Well, why aluminum and sulfur have different chemical properties. So different chemical properties, okay? Now, number 55 has nothing really to do with the graph, as you can see. So if you're not, if you don't like the blurb, I call it the blurb, the information above these part two questions or these free response questions, go right to the questions. This question has nothing to do with that chart, but it has everything to do with something on the periodic table, okay? And the major thing is, why do certain chemicals have similar chemical properties? They do so because they're related because they have the same number of valence electrons. But if you have different chemical properties, it's because you have different what? 
valence electrons. That's what that's about. Okay, so you've talked about families of elements. The most, I would say the most, uh, uh, you know, the four most common ones you have to know is like, let's look about the alkali metals, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, right? Sesnium. They're related. We call these the alkali metals. Now, they didn't want you to answer this this way, but I'm just kind of teaching you what's is what makes them related because they're in a family of elements. They're in a group. They're related because they all have one valence electron and they all become plus one to lose that what valence electron. All right. So it's very important you understand why elements were put under each other. That was the idea of Dmitri Mendeleev. Mendeleev. When he put his pyrrhic table together, it wasn't about electrons or protons. He didn't know anything about those things. They were still discussing whether even atoms existed. But he was trying to put elements, pure, 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 pure forms of matter that we knew of based upon um, their uh, chemical properties, essentially. And he put them in order based upon how their chemical properties actually repeated. He noticed there was a repetition and we now know that repetition of chemical properties was the valence electrons. So, so if you have different, okay, if you've got different number of valence electrons, okay, then you have essentially different properties. So this is, all this is different valence electrons. Let's go to the answer. So I wrote aluminum and sulfur have different valence electrons. And you could have said aluminum has... Uh, you know, it's three valence electrons and sulfur has its six, um, have different outermost electrons. There's, there are many different ways to write that, but that is essentially the answer. On to number 56. Number 56. Identify the element in period three that reacts with oxygen to form an ionic compound represented by X in the formula X2O. Again, 54, 55, 56 were based on the information, but you can see that these two questions are just questions on their own. Questions I've seen in the multiple choice section, all right? So people say, oh, I need to review the part 2B and part C. That's great to see how they, what, present the same information you're seeing in the multiple choice section. So it's not a waste of time to spend time, especially in part 2A. Any case, back to the question. So they're giving us X2O. And they're saying that's the formula. And we know that this is going to be, okay, uh, an ionic compound. So that's screaming to me that that X must be a metal. And how do I know? we got to know, or we have to know, sorry for the poor English there, but we have to know that if something is ionic, it means it's a positive ion attracting a negative ion. Okay, and metals become positive because they lose them because they're large radii. Okay, and nonmetals tend to gain because they're small radii. They attract electrons. Any case, so because I know this is a positive negative scenario, I need to know that ionic, I need to write a chemical formula so that the entire compound equals zero. That's the key here. So if I look at the oxidation state or what charge oxygen likes to become, I will find that pyrrhic table that it loves to become negative two. All right. And there it is. In all of its glory, it is negative two. Okay, so it's telling you what charge it likes to become when it likes to gain two electrons to what? Uh-oh, fill its octet to 2-8, right? Being 8 is stable like a noble gas. That's the driving force why oxygen. But why can oxygen gain two? Because it's a non-metal. It's small, loves to gain, grr, gaining electrons, likes to reduce. All of this is interrelated. Okay, knowing now that oxygen likes to become negative 2, all right, I like to put the bottom number, I like to use the bottom numbers, okay, have to equal the overall charge, right? So I'm going to put this as zero. It's kind of how I do it. Certainly many ways to do it. Now, if there's only one oxygen in the formula that they give us, then the oxygen is negative two. And now I know that the um, X2, okay, which is going to be the metal, overall has to be plus two equals zero. Has to be, right? But because there's two of them, the individual charge of this unknown metal we're calling X must be plus one. Notice what I did there. I took that plus two and I divided 
by two because two of them contribute to the overall charge, which had to be plus two to balance off the negative two because all ionic compounds are electrically neutral. Okay, so each atom there or, uh, or metal had to be plus one. Okay, so we're looking for an element in period three that likes to be plus one. And as I have previously mentioned, I just drew the alkali metals and the alkali metals, okay, like to become plus one because they only have one valence electron. And if I don't know that, I could also go to the periodic table and find that that would be the element. So in period three, I would need sodium. So this would be sodium oxide, Na2O. It's great that I write it here, but I need to write that in the answer booklet. And I write it there. Of course, it's 56, two sodiums, each one's plus one. Okay, and of course, each oxygen negative two, and that would be Na2O as sodium oxide would be the name. Well, on to 57. Number 57, they give you another blurb here. Okay, and we might have to go to it if we need it. I like to go right to the question and kind of relieve my fears if that's some blurb that I'm not really connecting with. I don't want students to get intimidated by this information. Although I don't think in this particular sentence it's intimidating, but state in terms of electrons. Here we go again. They want you to state in terms of a certain way. So I want your answer to be uh, in a way that you're talking about electrons. Okay, if you're not, if your answer isn't in terms of some kind of electron concept, you're going to get this wrong, even if you're right. Okay, so they're kind of giving you a clue. It's about electrons, people, so let's answer it from the clue. Why the radius of beryllium plus two ion is smaller than the radius? They're telling me how to answer. So I like to write this one out. So we have an atom, and every time you hear atom, you think neutral. Okay, so we have Be, it's an atom, it's zero charge, and it's gonna move to Be plus two. And like they said, the radius of the ion, not a great circle, is going to be smaller than the radius of the atom. So clearly they're telling us that. And they, the answer is, well, state in terms why this happens. So, so there's so many ways to say this, but I like to think about this. For beryllium to become plus two, did it gain or lose electrons? And we should get this, right? If we were writing a, what, a reduction or oxidation or redox half reaction, we should notice that this would be oxidation, right? To write a half reaction, I would put the two electrons here. And how? why would I do that? A negative two and a plus two gives me a total of zero on this side. I know this is not a redox problem, but I want to show you how all these things are interrelated. This side is zero. So I'm trying to show you that electrons were lost by the beryllium, okay? And if you lose electrons, your radius that's remaining, the ion or ionic radius, that's why sometimes they call us the ionic radius, and they'll call this the atomic radius. They could say these words in state, instead of the way that they're saying it here. But the ionic radius is smaller because you lost electrons. The beryllium plus two has two less electrons. And the way to remember this, okay, is that if you lose weight, you get smaller. If you gain weight, you get bigger. So if you're a nonmetal who loves to gain electrons, you have a higher attraction, you pull your electrons in because you have a higher nuclear charge as you go across the row, okay? If you gain electrons like chlorine, I'm writing this here because they can write this same question doing the opposite. If chlorine atom becomes chlorine negative one, the ionic radius is going to be bigger than the atomic radius because you're gaining electrons to become negative. You're starting out zero, but you're gaining. You're gaining weight. You get bigger. You're losing weight, okay? You're getting smaller, okay? So in terms of electrons, why is the ion, there, okay, smaller? Because the atom lost, the beryllium lost, two electrons, or the beryllium plus two has two less electrons. Okay, now if you want to know why, okay, because I'm really getting after trying to answer this correctly, if your beryllium plus two 
and you have two less electrons, well, you're still beryllium, okay? And a beryllium atomic number four, which means it has four protons in the nucleus, okay? If you've got four electrons, okay, the protons attract the electrons. But if you've got now what? Two electrons, hey, the plus four still is there. But you're going to pull this guy in because... You're still plus four, but you can now the what? Protons outnumber the electrons, okay? Or another way to think about it is that if beryllium, if you look it up on the, uh, on the reference table, the pyrrhic table, you'll see that it's uh, two dash two. There's two electrons in the first shell. Remember, the nucleus is always in front. And there's two electrons in the second shell. Well, if you know that as you put electrons in a new shell, the next shell is always farther away. The reason why atoms get bigger as you go down a, um, a column, okay, not a row, go down a column, is electrons are being added to a shell that's a new shell that's farther away. So if you get rid of the outermost shell, and we would if we lose two, the remaining core electrons, getting rid of the valence, the outermost, are now be closer, different ways to answer the same thing. So let's go to the answer booklet. Okay, so I say that beryllium plus two is smaller because it has two less electrons than the beryllium atom. So many ways to say it. You certainly could say that the beryllium atom loses two electrons and the resulting um, beryllium plus two is now smaller. Okay, you could say, uh, you don't have to say there is two less electrons. So many ways to say it. And you can also say that you lose the outermost shell because beryllium has two valence electrons. If you lose those, the outermost shell is gone, and now the resulting shell that has electrons remaining, of course, is now closer. It is now because, you know, shells that are close to the nucleus or the earlier shells are closer. So many ways to say it, but the key here for me, for my students, is ions that lose electrons or atoms that lose electrons, metals, their resulting ions, cations or positive ions, however you learned it, are going to be smaller because the atom lost electrons, lost weight. If you have an atom like a nonmetal that becomes negative like nonmetals do because they're smaller and they attract electrons, their resulting ions are bigger because the atom gained weight or gained electrons. Gain weight, you get bigger. Lose weight, you get smaller. Okay, on to 58. Number 58, draw a Lewis dot diagram for an atom of boron. Okay, so we're going to do this, of course, in our answer booklet. But when you draw a Lewis dot diagram, okay, we look up boron. And we're going to look and see what the valence electrons are for boron. We're going to put the chemical symbol that's going to represent the earlier electrons called the kernel, and we're going to put as many dots as necessary as there are valence electrons. So let's go to the periodic table. And so boron is 2-3. So we're not going to write the kernel electrons. The kernel electrons are the core, okay, the core electrons, and let me make sure I write that correctly. So the kernel electrons are the inner electrons here, the first two. They're in the first shell. We are after the outermost shell, the ones that feel the nucleus less. They're available. They're, those are the ones involved in bonding. So I just need three dots with a B. Let's show that in the answer. And there we go. We've got a B with three dots. Where you put those dots is inconsequential. Does not matter. We're going to count three dots. You know, some people teach the S electrons go there, but listen, just put three dots. The B represents the current electrons, the two electrons. And of course, it represents, I forgot to mention, also the protons and neutrons. So it, basically, the B is the other electrons that are close to the nucleus and the nucleus itself. Okay, and that's all you need. And it's kind of interesting to see how much space they give us to do that for 58. Okay, on how big people are going to write here. So on to 59. Number 59. Explain in terms of molecular formulas and structural forms. Here we go again. Again, I'm going right to the problem. I'm leaving the blurb and information by itself. Obviously, this is going to be an organic chemistry question, but 
Explain in terms of molecular formulas and structural formulas. Again, I like to go right to the question to see if, in fact, I need anything above, or it's just a question that is popping up seemingly not really connected to any of the specific information. So they want you to answer this in terms of molecular formulas and structural formulas. You've got to know the difference. The molecular formula is exactly how many atoms and type. For instance, you know, water is H2O. I'll give you an example. There's two hydrogens and one O. It doesn't really give me the structure, just as how many of each element do I have. And, and sort of in like in a list. Okay. So that's important to recognize. So a structural formula is exactly what's given here. It shows where the atoms bonded. And we care about structural formulas in organic chemistry because as I always say to people, structure is king. You change the structure, you change the properties. So in organic chemistry, especially, you know, when we think about organic chemistry, the chemistry of life and all the biochemical um, molecules, especially think about biology, the shape of proteins act as catalysts, form is function, the structure is so vital, okay? So the structure is king. And we've seen this in earlier questions, right? If you talk about um, allotropes, talk about pure carbon, carbon can bond in a certain way, pure carbon, to make diamond. It can, it can have a different structure, even though it's made of pure carbon, to make graphite, which is in pencils. So it's important you know that the actual arrangement of the same things can drive a different set of properties. Okay, so explain in terms of molecular form and structural form why one butene is an isomer of two butene. Okay, so they're telling us, essentially, can you answer this question in terms of what an isomer is? Now, iso means same, okay? So why is one butene an isomer of two butene? Well, if they are isomers and they're telling us Okay, and they're also telling us to answer this in terms of what? In terms of um, molecular formulas and structural formulas, we've got to say why it's an isomer based on that. So isomers, okay, would have the same molecular formula. Now, if you're not sure why, isomers are going to have exactly the same number and types of atoms. All right, for instance, if we draw this, one butene would look like this. I'm not loving the green here. So but means four carbons. I'm going to start with single bonds, but I know that I'm going to have to add a double bond somewhere because but uh, is four, but the ene means a double bond. The one butene means that the double bond is starting, okay, on the um, first carbon. I'm making the first carbon over here. I certainly can do that over here if we're trying to write this on a test, right? So any case, I'm going to move this over. Okay, so back to what I was trying to show you here. And this is one butene, and let's put in the H's. Uh, remember, every carbon must bond to four things. So one, two, three, we count the bond right there is four. And this carbon has one, two, three, four. This one has one, two, three, it needs one more. And this carbon has one, two, three, three, four. So if we write the molecular formula, I've seen part two questions where they just want the molecular formula. We would go C4, count the H's. It's a hydrocarbon, just hydrogen and carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And that'd be H8. And by the way, in table Q, you have a general formula for enes or alkenes, CnH2n double the amount of H's as carbons. But that's C4H8. Now, if I was to write 2-butene, which is the question, I'm just going to have the same thing. I'm going to have four carbons. Let's write it over here. Four carbons. But I'm going to have the double bond starting at the second carbon. Fill in the rest with H's so that every carbon is bonded to four things. And if we're going to count, okay, H is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is also C4H8. S uh, same number of atoms and types, same structure, molecular formula, that's what these are, but a different structure or structural formulas. Okay, that's what an isomer is. All right, same molecular formula, 
and different structural format. Different structure, different properties. It could have been, you know, gone that way. So let's get to the answer booklet here. So I wrote the two compounds would have the same molecular, same molecular formula, but different structural formulas. You certainly could have said it so many different ways. You could say both compounds are C4H8, but have different structures or structural formulas, okay? You could also say they both have the same number of carbon and hydrogen atoms, but they have a different arrangement. So you could, again, describe a structural or describe a molecular by saying it in those ways. Okay, but any case, this is a topic that will be either in your multiple choice or in your free response area. It is a big topic that continues isomers. Okay, number 60. Number 60, draw a structural formula. Okay, we now know what that is, or we should know it. There's an example of how the atoms actually arrange for the missing product X in the equation. Okay, so what this reaction is trying to show is that we only have, okay, we only have one product. Somehow, this H2 directly added to this reactant. Everything added. Now, they're not asking for it, but they could have. This is a great example of the organic reaction called addition. And addition starts with an unsaturated, hello, two double bonds right there between the carbon makes it an unsaturated hydrocarbon, right? Double or triple bonds are unsaturated because they have, what, under the maximum amount of H's because they're going to use up bonds between the carbon. So I'm even though this is not about identifying this as addition, all these comp concepts you need to understand. So the H2 is going to open up that double bond. So if we make this bigger and I white this out, it'll be all white, okay? So if I um, white this out, let's do that, and take out this double bond, you can see now, party people, and people that want to go to the party, we're going to be able to add one more bond here. I can do this. Here and here, and each H will add to two different carbons. And notice something, we now started... We started out as a um, unsaturated um, compound, and now it's saturated. And everything added because we had room once we opened that up. So that's what this reaction is showing, an addition reaction. So we're going to essentially draw this compound right here, which is butane now. They could ask you to, to, to name it. Bute for four carbons, single bonds, or ane. All right, so let's get that to the answer booklet. So there's my butane molecule. Notice I didn't draw the H's, but I drew the dashes representing where the H's can go, and that is totally acceptable. If that bothers you because you have some kind of, I don't know, you need to put the H's in, then make sure you do. Don't do that. Don't have one H. So if you're going to start with the H's, put all the H's in. But you can, you could have started just like I had with just the dashes. And the, to, re, to remember, every carbon makes four bonds. If it's making single bonds with its carbons, you can see that how many other bonds you need to fill out the molecule with the hydrogens. Okay, so that's on to number 61 now. Okay, number 61. State the number of significant figures used to express the volume of HCl. So just how many? So they're, in the last few years, they've been definitely getting on with making sure we know what a significant figure or be able to determine the number of significant figures from looking at a number. Significant figures are those digits, not, uh, you know, uh, numbers and zeros that have been measured from a measurement device. So in any case, if we look at the volume of hydrochloric acid, okay, I see that there is 24 Point zero milliliters. Okay, so the volume is right here. And they want to know how many significant figures, how many came actually from a measurement. We're going to eliminate any, um, I guess, placeholders. That's what we do. So the rule is very simple. All non-zero numbers are significant, so we know we definitely have two. Now, when do zeros count? Zeros always count if a decimal point is present. So ending zeros 
always count if a decimal point is present. So that zero was from the measurement device. So that would be three significant figures. Now, just go over some numbers. What if it was 240? I know it wasn't, but we're just going to go over it to teach this a little bit. Um, if you look at 240, there's no decimal point present. So that would mean that this number is not significant. It wasn't measured. It's being used to get out to the 240 values. So there'd be two significant uh, figures there. And if it was 2400, zero, zero, there'd still be two significant numbers because these ending zeros are really just placeholders. But if you were to put a decimal point there, hey, those ending zeros count, and that would be now 4 for 2400, and all those zeros count. Now, what about small numbers? Well, if you go to 0 0.0011, okay, well, those leading zeros are placeholders. They never actually count. So this would have two significant figures because leading zeros never count. They're always placeholders. They're helping us get out to a small number. Okay, now what if I had 0 0.00101? Okay, anytime you have uh, numbers that are uh, a zero that's sandwiched in between, okay, uh, non-zero numbers like the one, they count. Uh, leading zeros don't count ever because they're always placeholders, so that would be three. But what if I put point zero point zero zero one zero one zero? Okay, well, leading zeros don't count. Sandwich zero counts, but this ending zero does count because there is a decimal place. That'd be four. But back to the problem, 24.0, there's three sig figs. There's an ending zero, but it's not a placeholder because a decimal point is present, so we would write three. And so I just write three. I don't write 24.0. That'd be wrong. Some people did that. Okay, so make sure you write three. All right. Any case, back to number 62. Number 62. Identify the negative ion in this NaOH uh, compound using the titration. Okay, well, NaOH is a metal, and O and H are nonmetals. So this is an ionic compound. Specifically, it's a base. Okay, and you know that from Table K because they actually give this and identify it as a base. But really, it's an ionic compound that gives off hydroxides, and hydroxides affect the pH, and that's what makes it basic. So you should know that the Na is a metal, and only metals, okay, become positive. And if you check out Na in the reference table, in the pyrrhic table specifically, you'll see that it is plus one, okay? And hydroxide is a polyatomic ion. It has to be negative one collectively. And if you don't know that, you can go to table E. A lot of students are not using table E. So sodium is your plus. And then the OH collectively must be, that grouping must be negative 1. Again, I want to go there to show you that an OH is a grouping of nonmetals that stick together and act as a single ion uh, clustered together. We call it a polyatomic ion. So let's go there. All right, so here's table E that lists all of the polyatomic ions. And you can see that there's my hydroxide that acts as a cluster of nonmetals that stick together and they act as a single unit. Okay, it's important to realize that because if you are writing a chemical formula like zinc hydroxide, you know zinc is plus two. You can look that up on the upper right hand corner. And this cluster is negative one. It, it gives you that. So you notice that if we're going to make a, uh, a compound, an ionic compound, plus and negatives, metals and nonmetals, I am going to need two of these hydroxides. And so we use parentheses to say that, hey, we have two of these clusters. Why do I need two? Because each hydroxide polyatomic ion is negative one. So collectively negative two, zinc is plus two. So the answer to the question is, who the negative ion is, is the hydroxide. Okay, moving on to the um, answer booklet. All right, so I wrote the OH negative as it is listed uh, in table um, E, what I could not give credit for if you write OH without this negative ion, or if you use the words hydroxyl, like the hydroxyl group is a group of alcohols, right? Alcohols have a general formula, 
of some usual hydrocarbon, that's what the R means, the rest of a hydrocarbon, and an OH attached to it. They love in this regions to confuse you with bases that have hydroxide ions with alcohols that are not. Like, for instance, ethanol, which is a product of fermentation that we have in wine, liquor, and beer, okay, has this formula. This is not a hydroxide ion. It is covalently bonded, right? It's not an ionic compound. You would have to have like a K plus bonded to the OH minus. That's an ionic compound. That's a base. So just be careful of that scenario. This is called a hydroxyl group. It's not a hydroxide. And by the way, you could write hydroxide too. That would be acceptable. Okay, so any case. Uh, moving on to number 63. Number 63. Compare the number of moles of hydronium ions to the moles of hydroxide ions in the titration mixture when the HCl acid is exactly neutralized by the base. Okay, a lot going on here, but what is neutralization? Well, we know that acids give off H+, right? And we know that bases give off hydroxides. And we know that acids can be very dangerous. Acids can break down organic matter, including skin. So can strong bases, right? Because you probably learned that liquid Drano that you use in your uh, sinks to, break, to get rid of organic hairballs or whatever is blocking your drain could be used as well. So these things can be very dangerous under high concentration. But... We can neutralize their, their, their negative effects if there's too much of them by matching an H plus with a hydroxide to make water. So if you take a strong acid and strong base and you match perfectly all the H pluses with the hydroxides from the base, you will just get water with a pH of 7, which is not harmful. And that's what neutralization really is. Okay, we match all the H pluses just understand that hydronium is H3O plus and you should have recognized or should know from your chemistry course that an H3O plus is considered to be the same as an H plus. So in a titration where we exactly neutralize the acid by base, we're saying that all of these guys are being matched perfectly with these guys to make water. So therefore, the moles, which represents the number of, of them, okay, of the acid part, whether it's protons or H3O+, have to be equal. They're matching these perfectly. So compare the moles of uh, hydronium ions. And again, if you don't know that hydronium is H3O+, because it sounds like hydroxide, table E is your friend. Go to table E. They'll spell out H3O+, but you have to know that H3O+, is considered the same as an H+. Plus, all right, they're both from acids, and they're both going to be neutralized perfectly by one hydroxide. So you're going to match them perfectly. So the amount of the acid component is going to match the amount of the base component to make water. The moles will be equal. That's what neutralization is about. So I write the moles of hydronium ions equal the moles of the hydroxide ions. You certainly should just put the word, they are equal. They are the same, okay? Um, but there you go. Many ways to write the same thing. But neutralization is when you match the acid component perfectly with the, o, the base comp component to essentially make water. And actually make salt water, right? Acid base makes salt water. Any case, on to number 64. Number 64. Complete the equation in your answer booklet for the neutralization reaction by writing the formula for each product. Okay, I've seen this in a multiple choice question where they want you to have the right formula for the neutralization reaction. So we're going to have to definitely do this in our answer booklet because that's where the clues are and that's why they want the answer. So on to the answer booklet for 64 here. Okay, so an acid-base reaction, they want the two products. And when I introduce this in my class, I think of neutralization reactions as another example of double replacement. We don't call it double replacement. We call it neutralization because we're neutralizing the acid component with the base component. Uh, and acids 
plus bases makes salts and waters, but this is really a double replacement. Again, we use the same skills, right? So if you think about this, zooming this up here, we know that the, the, the hydrogen here is going to be a plus one that comes off. That means that the chlorine is negative. We know that the hydroxide, this collective OH, is a polyatomic ion. It's negative one. And the sodium is plus one. So all we're going to do, party people, is we're going to just double replace here. Double replace and switch the partners, or do si do if you're into square dancing. I don't know if you are, and I hope that you're not. So H plus hooks up with the OH minus. And we're going to make water. That's always the component of an acid-base reaction. And I'm going to write it as HOH. You don't have to, but it's a nice way to do that to remind, hey, an H goes with an OH to see that this is the hydroxide. It's still negative 1, that cluster. H is plus 1. Now, you should not have any ions. But when you make formula, make it a point to just make sure that everything equals 0. Okay, what else is moving here? All right, well... This positive is going to hook up with this negative, like you would in a double replacement. And I always write the positive ion first, Na plus, is going to hook up with the Cl negative. And I can see that it's one to one. Don't fall in a trap of thinking we just move stuff around and don't consider that a new formula might appear. In this case, we're just moving the exact ions. So plus one and negative one, it works out in this case that I didn't have to make any changes, and there it is. So what happens is, and I don't care what you do here, but those are the two compounds. And again, as I said before, an acid, and you know it's an acid because table uh, K has it, an acid plus a base makes a salt, and another word for salt is ionic compound, metal, nonmetal, and water. Okay, and that's the answer. And again, I see that a lot. That's, that you need to be able to predict the two products. And sometimes they just come out in multiple choice and say, which of the following things is what happens with an acid and base reaction or neutralization and it's acid, base, salt, and water. Okay, on to number 65. Number 65. Determine the molarity of the hydrochloric acid solution, aqueous, based on the titration data. They're saying titration data. They're saying neutralization. There's acid and base. This is a classic math question here. Okay. And you need the titration formula. So if you hear titration, you're adding an acid to a base, you should think, oh, this is that titration formula. And I want to show you because if you're getting this wrong, you're missing a vital math question that is almost always on the regions. So let's go to reference table uh, to remind us. And reference table T gives us all of our, most of our equations we need. Okay, here's table T. Let's scroll down until we find the titration. Oh my gosh, there it is. It's a titration formula because we have a titration problem. I know it's a titration problem because I'm adding an acid to a base and I'm trying to find out some information. And to look at this, we see that that's the formula we use. The molarity of the acid times the, 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 the volume of the acid equals the molarity of the base and the volume of the base. So MV of A equals MV of B. Okay, let's put that to use in the problem. So I'm going to write that um, right here. Okay, so I'm going to do MV of the acid equals MV of the base. I'm going to plug this in and I look at our data now, so I guess... I've got to scroll up to see. And what we have, okay, is we have, um, let me just make this like this. And I'm going to move my little guy over because I can see we're out of the range where you can see. So there is my, there's my formula, okay. And they're giving me um, 160 milliliters of a what? 160 mil, 16.0 milliliters of a 0.18 molar NaOH. That goes with the base. The OH is the base. So I'm going to plug that in for the base. So the base has a molarity. I'm going to just plug that in here. Okay. Of 16 milliliters. Okay. And you know what? I'm just going to plug it in right in the formula so I don't have to move stuff around. So the molarity, let's do the molarity first, 0.18. I can do this. 
0.18. Okay, so I'm going to change the color, give you some contrast. So 0.18, that is my molarity of my base. What is the volume? 16.0. So get rid of this, and I'm going to add 16.0. Okay, let's go find what they gave us for the acid. Well, the acid, they gave us just 24 milliliters. So I'm going to plug that in. Okay, so 24 milliliters. Okay, and I'll put that there. And all I need to do now is solve for my unknown. Now, if you don't like the M left over, as some people don't, Okay, I'm here to help you. You can throw in a what? An X, if that makes your life nice and nice. Okay, and so that is our formula, or that's our work, and we're gonna, uh, I'm going to finish solving for this in the answer booklet because it's, I can do the work here, but I better show my answer or scratch work um, in the uh, answer booklet. Okay, so I answered the question. Essentially, what I did, party people, is I took the same setup that we plugged in from the uh, test area, and then I just used my algebra, right? So I'm solving for my unknown, which is the M of A or the X, that's what that is, and I divide by 24, and do your math, you get 0.12, okay? You can put 0, 0.12 or 0.12, it's not gonna make any difference, but that's the answer for the molarity of the acid using the titration formula. It's a plug and chug formula. You had the formula, you plugged in the values, you used your algebra, straightforward, but you had to know this was a titration. How do you know? Acid and bases are being added. You hear the word titration or neutralization, okay? I've seen this question in the multiple choice section as well. So these things are popping up in both places onto number 66. Number 66. So we're in part C now, and the blurbs that I like to call are getting bigger. And sometimes in part C, you're going to have to go back into these blurbs a little more to do some reading comprehension. Not always. And sometimes the diagrams kind of get funky, and they, some of these questions can be a little more challenging and a little more or less intuitive. you got to read into the problem more. But a lot of these questions, okay, are just straightforward skills that are built into the blurb, so to speak. And Again, don't be intimidated. I always tell my students, go right to the question. Let's do it. 66, show a numerical setup for calculating the number of moles of oxygen required for the average person per day. All right, well, listen. They want moles. Calculate the moles of oxygen gas. So we want to go to moles. So my guess is they've got some grams here. Now, that's per average per day. So I go back into the blurb, and they tell me, Okay, they're telling me that there's 840 grams of oxygen per day. Right in there. So I'm going to have to go in there and pull that out. I had to go back, but all they're asking is, can you convert 840 grams of oxygen to moles? So let's do that. All right. And again, the, so they gave me, oh my gosh, the gram formula mass. Okay, so they're doing half of the work for me. Now, how I do this, okay, is I would give the grams, which were 880, make sure I got that right, so 840, right? Again, I would have made that mistake, 840. Take my 840 grams, and I'm going to times it by a converting factor. Now, you say, oh my gosh, what are you doing, Mr. Grotsky? I never like to know, or uh, I, I hate to teach you need to multiply or divide. Use your units. Right, so I want a mole, so that would go on top. Right, the unit I want is on top, and the unit I want to get rid of mathematically is on the bottom. This helps me remember, should I be multiplying or dividing? Okay, well, the converting factor is 32 grams per mole, and if you didn't, they didn't give you that, we go to the atomic mass of oxygen. Because there's two of them in the formula, we would do 16 times 2, and you would get 32, right? So they gave it to us. And that's all I'm doing here. And this reminds me that I need to cancel my grams to get to mole. All right. And this, of course, now I'm just dividing, okay, 840 divided by 32. And I put this in my handy dandy calculator. All right. And I get 
I got big fingers sometimes, so I mess up. Uh, I get 26.25. Now, I got my answer here, and I have to remind myself to what? Read the question. They wanted me to show a numerical setup. So very simply, they just want the setup. The answer isn't important. So all I need to do is show the setup. So I'm going to take my setup here and transfer it to the answer booklet. So you're going to see that often, just show the setup. Not sure why we just don't get the answer here, but they want to see if you can just set the answer up to do this. So we'll do that in the answer booklet. Okay, so um, this is my work here. We certainly could do this differently. We could have 840, you know, divided by 32. That would work too. You don't have to have the units. It doesn't have to be as clean as that. You could be showing a proportion. You don't have to, again, show units, but some work that shows 840 divided by 32. They just want the work. Now, if you solve for it, okay, if you solve for it, okay, that's great, but you've got to have the work here. The work is what they're looking for. Okay, that's essentially right here is what they want in terms of just showing me the setup. And they do this often, so make sure that you identify um, that in the question as they did, and as I didn't pick up initially. Okay, so on to 67. Number 67, state the change in oxidation number for oxygen during the electrolysis reaction. Now, electrolysis just means we're adding electricity to make this happen. It's non-spontaneous, right? But who cares about that, right? So the equation is given to me here, and I need to assign oxidation numbers to where the oxygen is to see the change. So this is a redox reaction if the oxidation numbers are changing. That's not really part of this question, but all these concepts are important to know. So let's make this bigger, and I'm going to assign oxidation numbers. Okay, so when I do this, I recognize that oxygen in a compound is almost always negative 2. Now, it can be 0 if it stands alone, and since we have the oxygen standing alone as an element, we should recognize that that's a zero, okay? If it's bonded to something here, okay? And by the way, why is it zero? Because these are atoms, and atoms, when I say atom, you say neutral. Now, these two atoms are bonded together because it's a nice, perfect match to get a double bond in an octet, but standalone elements have the same number of protons as electrons will always be electrically neutral. You say atom, I say neutral. Say it, neutral. Okay, now, um, if you go to the oxygen, it's almost always negative 2. There are two scenarios where it could be negative 1, and that would be a hydrogen peroxide, or I should just say a peroxide, where you have an O2 ion at the end of a compound. Okay, and you can see that actually in table E. Or you can just work this out. Hydrogens are in front. They're going to be plus 1. They're almost always plus 1. They could be negative 1 only if... There's a group 1 ion in front, like if you have a sodium and then you have a hydrogen, sodium can only come plus 1, and hydrogen is negative 1. So uh, essentially, all of the times, hydrogen is plus 1. There's, there's two of them. I don't let the coefficients make anything happen to me. Coefficients are not important in assigning individual oxidation states. Now, there's two H's here, so the total charge of all the H's is plus 2. There's only one oxygen, so it has to be negative 2. I wasn't sure, and the whole thing equals 0. I use a total charge on the bottom to figure out the individual charge. So I'm giving you different ways to think about it, but the O is negative 2. You could have looked it up straight from the reference table, but there is a scenario where it's negative 1. All right, And if I worked from the hydrogens back to the oxygen, I could figure out that it was negative 2. Bottom line is O negative 2 is going to oxygen zero. The oxidation state is going from negative two to zero. Okay, And that should also, you should understand, even though it's not part of this question, that our number is going up. Okay, And if our number is going up, that means that we're getting rid of electrons. This is an example of oxidation in this case. Okay, any case, let's go to uh, the answer booklet to answer this. So from negative 2 to 0, 
All right, and you could put the words in. You could actually put the O negative 2 to the O0 if you wanted to, but negative 2 to 0 onto number 68. Number 68. All right, determine the number of moles of oxygen vented into the cabin when 120 moles of water undergoes electrolysis. Now, this could really, really confuse a lot of people. The electrolysis is the reaction they give you. Okay, so when it undergoes this reaction that you're giving you. And the vented into cabin stuff, don't worry about it. This is a way they do this in part two where they kind of doctor up a problem to make it look so different from something you haven't done before. What they're saying is, if I have 120 moles of water, how many moles of oxygen will be produced? <laughs> That's really what they're saying. So we're going to go back to this problem. I'm going to erase all these things that we used for another explanation of another problem. But this is a stoichiometry problem. And, and as I've been saying before, I've seen this problem in the multiple choice section. And you need to be able to identify it. So there are many ways to answer this, okay? But I'm going to answer it, okay, in a way that it gets you the answer the easiest, okay? So if you're a chemistry teacher out there, you may cringe, but I just want you to see how I do this for my students to just get the answer right if we're struggling to see what the problem is. So we have 120 moles of water. I'm going to put that over water right here. And we're looking for the moles of oxygen. That's my X. I'm trying to build a proportion. This is a mole-to-mole -mole stoichiometry. And I'm going to put in my denominator the coefficient, because that's a ratio, 2. And there's no number in front for oxygen, which is implied as a 1, so I put the 1 there. So what happens is I have a proportion. 120 over 2 equals X over 1. Okay? Cross your multiply, and we get 2x, all right? So we get 2x equal 120. Do your math, divide by 2, x equals 60. That's all we did there. And, you know, if you think about the ratio, okay, there's two water molecules for every 102. Now, that's a ratio of how many moles are how many. So if it's going 2 to 1, we're basically going to cut in half, 120 to 60. Okay, so this is a mole-to-mole -mole stoic problem that could have been presented to you in the multiple choice. In part C, they doctor it up based upon the blurb, but you've got to be able to unpeel that onion and find that same problem. These same problems pop up. So again, in the part two, you're going to unpeel it a little bit. So they're asking for moles. They're giving you moles of another compound. They're giving you the reaction, so this is that type of multiple stoic problem. Answer, of course, is 60. Now, I know some teachers teach, oh my gosh, don't do it that way. That's fine, but right now I'm trying to help students answer the question the best they can. And for those uh, chemistry purists out there, I could do it this way. I would start with 120 moles of water. And I want to get rid of water, so water goes on the bottom. I want O2. You might have learned it this way. Here's 102, and there's two water molecules. And notice the water cancels, and I would take 120 times 1, divide by 2, and that would give me 60 moles of O2. Everyone's happy now. But I need 60 to be 60 moles. Let's put that in the answer booklet. So 68, 60 moles. On to number 69. Number 69. Determine the percent composition by mass of hydrogen and water. This has absolutely nothing to do with the blurb, okay? It's just a straight math skill can you pull out. So a percent composition by mass. Anytime you do a percentage, composition, percentage, it's essentially part over total times 100. Now, when we do a percent by mass, it's a classic math problem. The total is the total mass per one mole. It's the easiest thing to do because we can add up all the atoms to get that formula mass or the molecular mass. Okay, so they talked about water. So water is easy. We need that molecular mass. We call it a molecular mass if it's molecules. Molecular, and why is it a molecule? It's covalently bonded. But it's the same thing. So how do we do that? Well, very simple for water. 
okay, we're going to have two H's. And we're going to times it by, because there's two atoms, we're going to times it by its atomic mass. If you go to the periodic table, it has an atomic mass of 1.001 or something like that. We're going to round to a whole number, to a 1. And 2 times 1 is 2. I can do that math. And then we're going to have one oxygen in the molecule, one times the atomic mass of oxygen. That's, of course, going to be 16. Again, it'd be 15.99 something in your reference table. Round to 16. And you get 16. You're going to add them together. And that would be 18. And that would be uh, something that's off the screen there. There's 18. And that's 18 grams per mole. Okay, I'll put that unit there. But don't really need that. But that's 18 grams per mole. And we're going to do that per one mole. So we're going to put the total per one mole on the bottom. All right. I didn't like that line anyway. Okay, so my total here is 18. All right, what's the part? Well, they asked for the mass of hydrogen in water. So party people, in water, okay, I can do this. In water, there's 2 out of 16. Out of the total mass of 1 mole of water, we, we, we assume 1 mole every time with this, and out of 18, 2 grams is due to the hydrogens. That's our part. Okay, so it's the mass of the hydrogen in one of these formulas of the total. So of the 18 grams that makes one mole of water, two grams is due to the hydrogen. And we have to read that carefully. They could have done oxygen. So there's my formula. Okay, and we have to make sure that they want the answer or just the setup. I've fallen prey to that. They just they want to determine the percent composition. So they want the answer. So, hey, uh, 2 divided by 18 times that by 100, and, and uh, of course, you get about 11%, 11.11, but 11% works for me, 11.11% if you want to do that. Okay, well, we got to put that in our answer booklet. Let's do that. Very simple math problem and a very simple one to say, I don't know how to do that. Review percent by mass. It's an easy one. A lot of times they'll give you the formula or molecular mass. Okay, so this is definitely a very, very important, and I would say common math problem that pops up even again in the multiple choice section or in this section here. Uh, I wrote 11%. I could have put 11.11. They were accepting anything from 11 to 11.223. Okay, so how you round was is totally inconsequential here. On to number 70. Okay, so number 70, balance the equation for the reaction, okay, of lithium hydroxide and CO2 in your answer booklet using the smallest whole number. So again, really, uh, again, not much to do with what this is given to you. It's a totally different question. That's why it should not get intimidated by the perps because they're going to give you questions that are just totally unconnected to these problems. They really are, okay? So let's go balance using the law of conservation of mass in our answer booklet. Okay, so we're balancing this reaction as given to us, and we're using the law of conservation, meaning the same amount of atoms and same type have to be on both sides because we don't destroy, we don't um, uh, uh, destroy or make new atoms, right? So the same number and same type, they're just rearranged. So this is a puzzle, and I'm going to show you how I go after this puzzle, but you certainly can do this many different ways to get to the same result. The same result is the same number, same type of atoms on both sides. So when I scan this, I see that there are two lithiums atoms. And there's only one here. Okay, so I'm going to throw a 2 here. Okay, now by putting a 2 here, all right, I notice that now I have two oxygens from the lithium hydroxide. I already have two oxygens. Remember, this is the reactant side. I'm balancing all the same stuff on one side to the other. So that gives me a total of four oxygens. Now, when I look at the reactant side, the product side, I'm sorry, the product side over here, that's where I'm comparing to, I, uh, I see that I have, oh, I have an oxygen here, which is one, and I have three here. That gives me four. So, so far, I have four oxygens on both sides, okay, and I have two lithiums on both sides, okay, I have one carbon, 
and one carbon. And I have two H's. And because I put the two in front to balance the lithium, I've got two H's. So I've got the same number and same type on both sides. And I'll review that if I went too fast because I think my writing is kind of sloppy here. Okay. So I'm comparing, all right, I'm comparing the reactant side with the product side. Okay. And on the reactant side, there's two lithiums and there's two lithiums on the product side. There, are, because I put a two here to balance these two lithiums here, there is two hydrogens. And because water's, I didn't put any coefficients in front, there's, because of that, that, that subscript, there's two H's here. That's balanced. Okay. There's two oxygens, because this two means I have, by the distributive property, two oxygens. But I add that to the two oxygens that are already in another chemical on the reactant side. So two oxygens plus two oxygens gives me four oxygens. And if I count, I have one oxygen here and three here, no coefficients to change those. I have four oxygens, so my oxygens are balanced. And I have one carbon, and I have one carbon, everything's balanced. So to clean this up, because it is a little busy, all we needed was a two in front of the lithium hydroxide to balance this, okay? All I needed was a two. And that made sure that there was the same number and same type on both sides. Okay. Now, if you want to put ones in front, you can. Maybe your teacher said nothing in front implies a one. So you could put a one there, but it's not necessary. And I don't like to do things that are, that are not necessary. So a two in front is all you need there. And again, it's a puzzle. That's kind of how I attacked it. We could do it a different way, but we have to come to the same result. Same number, same type of atoms on both sides. On to number 71. Number 71, determine the parts per million of calcium carbonate in the tap water sample. So you notice I went right after the question. I didn't even go and read the blurb. Don't. Some people get intimidated. If I have to go back, and in part C, a lot of times I do. There is some information that I need for some of these questions. So they want the part per million of the tap water. Now, part per million is a type of concentration term, and it's given to you in table C. So we'll go there for a second, but they've got to give me some information here. A sample of tap water contains dissolved ions. Okay, so I have this. Let's make this a little bigger. Okay, so a sample of tap water contains such as calcium magnesium, and they give me a 150 gram sample of this tap water contains a small amount of grams of calcium carbonate. And there's the two pieces of information I need. That's, that's the uh, grams of the solution. That's water that has those ions. And that's the exact amount. Okay, so what do I do with that? Well, I've got to put that in my part per million formula. If you don't know your part per million formula, let's go to table T. That's where most, if not all, your formulas are. Let's go there. Okay, table T, let's scroll down and see if we can find a part concentration terms. Ah, there's two, right? We have concentration for molarity and we have parts per million, right there. Mass of my solute, that's going to be the calcium carbon they give you, the mass of the solution. Notice we're timesing it by a number here, which is a million, okay? So we're gonna use that formula and guess what? We're gonna plug and chug. We're gonna put exactly the numbers in. So all of the formulas, and a lot of the math that we've done have been these formulas that we just plugged in what they gave us. Okay, let's go back to the uh, question. So part per million was the mass of my solute. Okay, which is the ions. All over the mass of the solution. And we times that by a million. I'm going to write 10 to the 6. But that's the same thing as one with six zeros. Okay. Uh, of course, I keep doing this. I'm going to move this over. All right. And we're going to put our values in for this. Okay. So the mass of our solution was 150 grams. All right. There it is. So I'm going to take that mass of solute right there. 
and we're going to take put 150. All right. So 100. I'm sorry. They have the mass of the solute. That's the mass of the solution. I can do this. So the mass of the solution is 150. And what we have to put on top is the solute, the stuff being dissolved. That's the calcium carbonate. My, my, my bad. So that's going to be 0 0.00075. Make sure I got three zeros and a 75. So I'm going to take the mass of my solute. That's the stuff that we're trying to see how much of it is concentrated or dilute, how much is in the water. And then, of course, the mass of my solution is here. Okay, and so I'm going to take that out, and I'll put the value given to me here, and that is 150 grams. All right, and put this in my calculator, Not, and plug and chug. So 0 0.00075 divide by 150 grams and then I'm going to times that by one and I'm going to put six zeros in my calculator. That's what the 10 to the 6 means. And what I get is this whole thing equals it equals 5 part per million. That's what I get. So plug and chug. Let's put that in the answer booklet. There it is. Five. And again, no sig figs necessary. So on to 72. Number 72. State in terms of aqueous ions why this tap water can conduct an electrical current. Okay. Conducting electricity in a solution means you must have something called an electrolyte. There's three things. Acids, bases, and salts. Salts break apart into ions. But more importantly, to conduct in a solution, you need to have free mobile ions. That's what electrolytes do. They conduct electricity because the positives and negatives can move through the solution. And if the positives move to one side or the negatives and or the negatives move to the other, that'll conduct the charge. And that's exactly how we conduct electricity in our own bodies, in our nervous system. Our neurons, our nerve cells, allow ions to flow in, and that movement of ions creates an electrical impulse that our brain can send signals, okay, uh, to our uh, peripheral to, uh, you know, determine sounds, tastes, smells, our senses, and also tell our heart to keep breathing or when to increase respiration. So our nervous system. Okay, our complex nervous system works by electrical impulses, by free mobile ions. Who has free mobile ions? Acids, bases, and salts, or, ion, or uh, ionic compounds. Since this is talking about, okay, ions, okay, that's what you really need here. So let's put that down. And that's what that's about. They love to ask about that. So moving on to the answer book. So I wrote, tap water contains free mobile ions. I gave the examples. I didn't have to. You can just say that there are mobile ions. The water contains dissolved ions. Okay. But to conduct electricity in a solution, it's about the idea that there are charges that can move. And by the way, this is tapped to the, this is tied to the idea that salts or solid ionic compounds do not conduct electricity because their ions can't move. They're stuck in a crystal. So ionic compounds only conduct when they have free ions, which is in a liquid state, or like this case, aqueous. Just some things that are interconnected here. On to number 73. Number 73. Using the key in your answer book, draw at least two water molecules in the box showing the orientation of each molecule toward the calcium plus two. Okay, so this is about how the ions actually exist in water. What kind of, we call these molecule ion attractions and the orientation they have because water is polar. It's got a negative end and a positive end. Another question could state, hey, can calcium, why can calcium ions or magnesium ions dissolve in water? And one of the reasons is that, well, water is polar and that's negative side can interact with the positive ions. They want you to show that orientation. Let's go to the answer booklet. Now, before we do that, Make sure you read this carefully. You have to draw at least two water molecules in the box. So if you draw one properly, but not two, we have to mark it wrong, right? 
and we have to show the correct orientation. Okay, so make sure you understand that you needed to have or need to have two water molecules. You've got to read carefully. You've got time to do so. Let's go now to the answer booklet. So as I said, I have to draw at least two. Now you may say, why do I have the uh, oxygen atom pointing toward the calcium? And it has to happen for every oxygen. So if you drew this with more than two, and you can because they said at least two. So if you did three, four, or five because you want to show off, you better show that each oxygen end of the water molecule is pointed toward the calcium. Calcium is positive. You should know that a water molecule is polar, and it has a negative end or a partial negative end, which is by the oxygen, and a partial negative end by the H's. And why? Well, because essentially oxygen is more electronegative than the H. So this electron density is pulled upward toward the oxygen. The oxygen end has more of the electron density. So it's very negative. And if you blow this, if you draw it another way, if we have oxygen over here, oh Christmas, I don't want that. If I have oxygen here and I show the bonds, because electro, because electronegativity of oxygen is greater, it's going to pull that pair closer to the oxygen in. And you can see that the H's kind of had their electrons pulled away. And make sure you remember that the oxygen will have a lone pair too if you do the Lewis dot diagram. So it's kind of easy to see here that the very electronegative and electron density here, that's the negative end of the molecule. Okay? And the positive end is where electron density was kind of pulled away. It's asymmetrical distribution of charge. So the negative end, the more electronegative end of oxygen, is going to be pointed to the positive. And that attractive force, although they're not asking for it, is a molecule ion attraction. Or it could be a dipole ion attraction. Dipole means polar molecule. Okay, so you don't need all the extra stuff here, but I'm trying to explain why I pointed the oxygen in. You don't need the dots here as well. Okay, so get those out of there. Any case, moving on to 74. Number 74, state evidence from the equation. That's this equation right here. The reaction is exothermic. How do I know this is exothermic? And I know because the heat, my friends, the heat, okay, is written on the product side. Look where the arrow is. It's to the right of the arrow. What does that mean? Well, that means, my friends, that if I have heat in the product side, uh, these are my products, I'm producing heat. That means heat is going to be given off. Heat is exiting. Think of exiting, exiting, exothermic. And we're going to give off heat. The temperature is going to increase in the environment. And if you draw a potential energy diagram, okay, as you'll do later, you'll see how, why the energy is given off. So all they needed to say was that the energy or the heat is in the product side of the reaction. You must know that. If the heat was in the reactant side, that would mean we'd need this plus heat to make it happen. That means you'd have to absorb energy. That'd be endothermic. Okay, so let's go to the test booklet. So I said the heat is written on the product side of the equation. Really not much more to say about that. Or I guess you could say the heat is a product. Um, uh, and so that is how you do that given a reaction. And if, if you run into a reaction, they ask for exo and endo, you don't see the heat, you should know that you're going to have to go to uh, table I. Table I gives you the delta H's, right? Delta H of exothermic is negative. It's given to that. So also know that if they ask for those things in a reaction, you don't see the heat written. You're going to need more information in table I. It could be your friend there. So on to number 75. Number 75, explain in terms of substances. They're telling us that we got to explain in terms of substances. Substances are either, okay, elements or compounds. Why the reaction is, is a decomposition reaction. They were nice. They told us it was decomposition. Decomposing, one thing breaks apart into smaller pieces. Think about decomposers. They take past living organisms and they break them down into the smallest minerals or uh, elements that, um, uh, nutrients that other animals need, right? So we're going to take one thing 
and we're going to break it down into other things. So if I was to take this, so one thing is broken down into two things. Now they said in terms of substances. So two substances is, I see the two there, is breaking down into three. Okay, and that's kind of how I'm looking at that. If it's decomposition, I'm going to break into more pieces than I started with. So they said substances. Now, again, a substance is either a molecule. Well, water is a molecule. And, and another substance is an element. So two substances breaks down to three. So three pieces is smaller than the, the, the two that you started with. Okay, so let's go to the answer booklet there. So, all right, two substances, I should say break down into three substances. Okay, now that's not exactly what they write in the New York State. Uh, they don't actually have that, but they also always say, but um, acceptable, but not limited to. So this would be right, that's how I see it. Um, uh, looking at the uh, scoring sheet, they, they can also say that one substance, H2O, breaks apart into two. I was looking at the balanced reaction, this would be perfectly fine. So if you said, if you see it as one substance, H2O2, okay, breaking apart into two, and O2 and water, okay, all right, I guess that would be fine, but to me that's not balanced, but they'll accept that. Um, another thing you could say that makes sense is you could say that a compound breaks apart into an element and another compound, okay, but this isn't balanced, so again, that's why I did two substances, but in any case, uh, all of that is fine. As you understand decomposing, you're going to make more pieces than what you start with. And all that is fine. So on to number 76. Number 76, state how the increasing temperature of the H2O2 affects the rate of the reaction. Again, I haven't really gone into any of the blurb or anything here. So, so any case, temperature, as we know, is an indicator, it's proportionate to, I shouldn't say equal, but proportionate to um, uh, average kinetic energy. As temperature goes up, so does average kinetic energy. So if temperature goes up, that means the molecular motion or the kinetic energy is going up. And so an increase in temperature will increase the rate of reaction. They're not even asking how. State, the incre state how increasing temperature, oh, they're asking for how, they are. State for how the increasing temperature affects the rate of reaction. Okay, well, the increasing temperature is going to increase the rate of reaction. Okay, that's really all they want. All right, so let's get that to the answer books. You should know that temperature, the reasoning why, of course, is temperature is an indicator of more motion. And if you have more motion, you should recognize that you're going to actually have what? More effective collisions. This is part of collision theory. And if you have more effective collisions, there's going to be more... Uh, chemical reactions. Reactions occur because of collisions. They didn't ask for that. They just want you to know that increasing temperature increases the reaction rate. Uh, pretty straightforward to me as something you probably already knew before you took Regents Chemistry onto the answer booklet. So I said an increase of, of temperature will increase the rate or speed of a chemical reaction. Pretty general thing there. They didn't ask you for why. Higher temperature, faster rate, many ways to say that. Okay, but on to number 77. Number 77, on the potential energy diagram in your answer booklet, draw a double-headed arrow to indicate the interval that represents the heat of reaction. Okay, so we know the heat of reaction, we should know the heat of reaction represents the change of energy from the potential of the products minus the potential of the reactants. Okay. So that is a definition you should know. Heat of reaction, sometimes called delta H, okay, is the um, potential energy of the products minus the potential energy of the reactants. That's important as we you need to know that definition because that sometimes comes up as a multiple choice question, but we kind of need that to able to, to figure out what part of the potential energy curve. Notice we decided that this was exothermic because the heat was on the product side, so we should expect a curve that starts high and goes low. 
Okay, why? Because energy is being released, and that energy is coming from the potential, which is the stored bonds. Okay, so let's go to that potential energy diagram in our answer booklet and mark it up where we think the change of heat or the heat of reaction, they're the same thing, is on that diagram. So as I said before we got to the answer booklet, heat of reaction is the potential energy of the products minus the potential energy of the reactants. Okay, so I always tell my students the most important piece to these potential energy curves is where you start and where you finish. As you can see, we're finishing lower. Why? Because energy was released. This is an exothermic curve. Obviously, the reaction was exothermic. Okay, so if you didn't know that, but you identified this to be exothermic, you can go back to the other problems. But how much heat was released? Well, the potential went down. Now, what's the potential? That's the energy in the bonds. This is not what you have to mark up, but I want to go over it so you understand. This arrow here is the potential energy of the reactants. This is the energy in the chemical bonds of the reactants. This is the potential energy of the chemical bonds of the products. Why are they lower? Because we use some of it to release energy. Okay, so what they want you to know is, hey, delta H or heat of reaction is the difference between this arrow and this arrow. Heat of reaction is the potential energy of the products minus so subtract this arrow from this arrow, and what you're going to get, party people, is the difference of those two dotted lines. So we're going to mark this up. So this is exactly the difference between that. So the difference of where you start and where you finish is your heat of reaction. Notice we're actually going to be going down here as we move forward. And that's why the delta H of exothermic reactions, the, the change of heat, is negative because you're going down from where you start. Okay, those are all important implications, but all we need to get this right is an arrow right there. Okay, and that's number 77. On to number 78. So number 78. Okay, they give you another blurb. Okay. I really don't care because I don't want to be intimidated if I have to go back into the blurb or the diagram, which, by the way, this should look very familiar to you with a salt bridge, electrodes. In fact, they're telling you it's a voltaic cell. <laughs> All right. So identify the subatomic particles, and you should know there's three of them, protons, neutrons, and electrons, that flow through the wire as the cell operates. You should recognize that a voltaic cell is your battery. It's your spontaneous application to redox, okay, that gives off energy without inputting energy. What I mean by that is by itself, it gives off energy. That's what spontaneous things do. Without any input of energy, it gives off energy, all right? Or things are occurring without any input of energy. And we know that batteries produce electricity. And part of what electricity is, is that electrons are flowing through the wire, and you learn that electrons flow from the anode to the cathode, but more importantly, what's flowing through the wire are electrons, right? It's a movement of electrons that create the energy to run our iPhones and everything else. So batteries produce energy. Part of that energy is producing the electricity, the movement of electrons. So I don't know how else to tell you, but um, this is a redox reaction. I know that because I see a standalone metal. It's a zero. I can see the oxidation numbers are changing. So voltaic cells or batteries are nothing more than an application and how we use redox reactions. And redox reactions, by the word redox, electrons flow from the things that give off electrons or lose them, Leo, to the ones that accept them. Remember, redox is reduction and oxidation. So electrons are flowing from the chemical that loses, Leo. If you, lose, if you use that acronym, Leo the lion says, grr. So the one who oxidizes is losing electrons, and the one who reduces is gaining them. There's a flow of electrons. So it's just electrons, number 78. Let's go to the reference table. But instead, we'll go to the answer booklet. And I put electrons, and you, you do, if you're into the symbols, you can do e to the negative one, okay? 
If you do an E without the negative, they don't accept it, so don't get too lazy there. Okay, on to number 79. Number 79, compare the number of electrons lost to the number of electrons gained during the reaction of this operating cell, this battery, this voltaic cell. People look at this and say, how do, I, how do I do that? Okay, well, my friends in chemistry, it's called, in a chemical reaction, or in a redox reaction especially, it's called conservation of charge. The electrons lost by the chemical that's oxidizing must be equal to the electrons gained. Look at my arrow. If it's not true, then we're going to lose electrons or destroy electrons, or create electrons. You can't do that. So this is such a silly question, but people get this wrong, they don't know what to do. It's the same, and I've seen this in multiple choice problems. Now, just to show you why it's the same, if I do the half reactions, okay, Mg0 goes to uh, Mg plus 2, and I'm just getting that from the reaction. I put two electrons so that both sides of a half reaction have the same charge. And if you do copper, copper plus two, how does that become copper zero? Well, you're going to need what? You're going to need two electrons. I didn't give myself enough room there. So let me, so you need two electrons. So copper plus two needs to gain two electrons. A negative two and a plus two gives me zero on both sides. And notice something. The same electrons that are lost are the same electrons that are gained. And when you're doing these reactions, I'm sure you did in class, if they didn't equal, you'd have to multiply by some number to make them equal, and then you cancel them. Okay? So that this number of electrons in a balanced chemical reaction will always be the same because you're always canceling them, okay? If that rings a bell or rings a gong or rings, I don't know, ringing in your ear, okay? So 79 is the same. It has to be because if it's not, guess what? The charge on one side of a redox reaction won't be the same. What's plus 2 and a 0? Hey, this side is plus 2. Hey, this side is plus 2. Why is the charge conserved? Because electrons are neither created nor destroyed or... Okay, the same number that I lost is the same number gained. Always! Okay, 79. Let's go to the booklet. Why not? So I said, with emphasis, the number of electrons lost equals the number gained. Okay, so on to number 80. Number 80. State the form of energy that is converted to electrical energy in this voltaic cell. They're not giving it away, so they say operating cell. Okay. Uh, well, we see this in multiple choice questions all the time, and it's going to be chemical energy, okay? Chemical energy, right? It's the chemicals that we put together in the right way, and that's going to give us the electrical energy. And really, it's, you know, the chemical energy is the energy in the bond, so to speak. So it's the chemical energy, all right? So let's put that into the answer booklet. Now, you see that all the time, all right? Pretty straightforward. Again, if you were to review just your multiple choice, especially 31 through 50, you are covering much of the same material. No, you're not practicing how to unravel some of these hidden gems, but it's the same material, my friends. Okay, on to the booklet. So I wrote chemical, and because chemical energy is measured in the chemical bonds, like our potential energy diagrams that we talked about, we had that question up before, uh, you can think, you can also say potential energy, right? So the reason why the exothermic diagram they give you before went high and went low is if we're going to give off energy exothermic, there's a lot of potential energy in the reactants, right? So something that can burn or explode has a lot of potential or energy in its bonds. So you could say potential energy as well. So I forgot to mention that, but that's all good. All right, so you don't need, of course, the diagram to answer that, and you don't need to have the slash potential, chemical, or potential is what they were looking for. But a lot of the multiple choice says chemical energy, so that you should rang a bell or a gong with that. Okay, so on to number 81. Number 81, write a balanced equation for the half reaction that occurs in the copper half cell. So the copper half cell is over here. So now we have to know if this is oxidation or reduction. Now, I certainly could go to table J 
and see that magnesium is higher than copper, which means magnesium oxidizes better. So this must be the place of oxidation, or we would say it's the anode because we have this mnemonic anox, okay? And the copper is the cathode because red cat, or I can just look at the reaction, my friends. The standalone metal always is oxidizing. Why? Because it's becoming positive. And I wrote the half reaction right there. Okay? If you have a standalone metal, it can never become negative. Metals that are atoms never become negatively charged. So they can't gain or reduce. Grr. Gaining electrons is reduction. Okay? So it's the copper plus two that's actually getting reduced. And of course, I did write it over here in another explanation, but I can just figure that out in my half reaction here. Copper plus two becomes copper zero. It's the first thing I do. Then I have to balance both sides. Oops, I gotta show you that. I've gotta balance both sides of the reaction. Now, with the charge, the correct charge, plus two and zero differs by two. So there's gonna be two electrons here. If I was to do this wrong, okay, and put the two electrons on this side, the check is a negative two and a zero would make this side negative two. This side, okay, is plus two. That would be incorrect. So you put the electrons in so that both sides of a half reaction have the same charge. Negative two and a plus two is zero. This side is zero. That's correct. And it's reduction because my charge is doing what? My charge is going down because I'm gaining electrons. All right, so let's put that half reaction into the work booklet because it's nice to put it here, but they're not gonna grade that. And I also tell my students for reduction, electrons are on the reactant side, R for R, another kind of thing. And also you should know that in the cathode side of the cell, we're ions in solution are becoming solid, so the cathode actually is getting bigger. By the way, the cathode isn't getting reduced here. It's the place of reduction. All these things are interconnected, but that is the correct half reaction for the reduction. And when they say balance, they said balance the charge. Zero on this side, zero on that side. Okay, on to number 82. Number 82, identify one metal from table J that is more easily oxidized than magnesium. Okay, well, if you go to table J, and we will in a second, there's two parts. There's the metal side, and there's the non-metal side, right? And what are metals good at? Metals are good at losing electrons. Metal atoms never become negative. Metal atoms always become positive. Metal always atoms lose electrons. The standalone metal is always oxidizing. So they give you a list of activity. Well, activity means how well it does something, or reactivity. So the metals are listed on their ability to oxidize. So there's a list here, and there's going to be magnesium, and there's going to be other atoms above it and below it. And the higher you go on the table, the better that you act as a metal, and metals lose electrons. They leo, they oxidize. So who oxidizes better than magnesium would be all metals above it. Who, act, who oxidizes not as good or least be below it. We sometimes we say who's reducing. So in table J for the metals, the one who oxidizes is above the one who reduces. You hear that all the time. But if you want something more active, more reactive, okay? If you were lucky enough to do a uh, lab where you had a reactivity of metals lab, the metals that reacted more vigorously are the ones that lost their electrons more more easily because they were higher in table J. There's more to it than that. I'm not a big fan of table J. I think we should use net potentials, but that's what we have in this uh, you know, list, list of reactivity. So the more reactive the metals, well, metals lose electrons. The ones that oxidize better are more reactive. I'm looking for something above magnesium, and let's go there. Here's table J in all of its glory, and we found our magnesium and we see the activity, the most active metals, that's the ones who lose electrons the best because the metals do, and who oxidizes. So I can pick any metal that I want. I have a choice. So anything from lithium here to sodium will work. All right, I'm going to say lithium, hedge my bets, and do the most active. I meant lithium ion batteries, remember? Okay, 
So, and if you were to work with the nonmetals, nonmetals gain electrons. So the most active are the ones that actually reduce the best. Okay, so that's a little flipped on its head there if you were to use that side. But here we're just picking a metal that's above magnesium. Okay, so on to um, our booklet. So the answer is just one element. It'd be lithium, the entire list above magnesium, all the way down to sodium. I did that, but you don't have to write the you don't write the answer that way. You pick one of them. So any of the elements that were above magnesium, that's lithium, rubidium, potassium, cesium, barium, strontium, calcium, or sodium, I pick lithium, but any one of those elements would work because it's above magnesium. And the list, more reactive, oxidizes better. Let's go on to number 83. Number 83, we've got this blurb. I see a nuclear reaction, so I can see that this is going to be about nuclear chemistry or nuclear physics, right? Uh, determine the fraction of BK249 that remains unchanged after 960 days. Ooh, this is starting me off with a half-life problem already. So I need some information here, but they gave me the total time. And they want to know what fraction remains. So it's decaying or transmutating. Transmutating is changing into a new a nucleus after a certain amount of time. So how many times does it half, right? It's going to be either one half or one fourth, one eighth, one sixteenth, one thirty second. We got to see how many times it halves. So I need some information. Um, so what I do here is I draw a, um, and I see that. Okay, so, so I'm looking at for 960 days. All right, and they're telling me some information here that's really important. The half life is 220 days. The reason I knew to go look for that is because I knew that BK was not in the reference table. Okay, so um, so any case, if I didn't or I needed the half life, I would go to table N. So that's a piece of information I needed to do this. So let's do let's do this. Okay. So now that I know it's 320. I'm going to do how I do my half life problems, and I start with a zero line, zero time, zero half lives, and then a hundred percent of my sample. In this case, it's one over one, right? Okay. So I'm going to get rid of that hundred percent because they want a fraction. So one over one. Okay. The total time. Okay, is 960 days. I want to know how many halvings have occurred. Well, they're telling me that 320, okay, was the amount of one halving. So I'm going to divide 960 by 320. And you can see that's going to be a perfect three, as it will be a whole number always. So that tells me that there are, okay, there are three half-lives, three halvings that occur. That's important. So in the first half-life, one over one becomes one half. In the second half-life, a half of a half is one fourth. In the third half-life, there is one eighth, and that's my answer. So pretty simple stuff, classic half-life problem, but I needed to know, okay, my half-life for this. Either table N or they had to give me. So if we looked at table N, I said, oh, I've got to look for it. So let's go to the answer booklet and put our answer in. So 83 is 1 eighth. You could also say 0.125. That's a, you can mean, you know, uh, 1 divided by 8 or percentage, 12.5 percent. They, you know, accept the percentage, the decimal, or the fraction. Even though they're asking for a fraction, they were very generous if you gave me the equivalent in another way, which I agree with. Okay, so on to number 84. Number 84, state in terms of both protons and neutrons. They're telling you exactly how to answer this. Why these two things, or these two, uh, UUS-293 and UUS-10, are isotopes. They love to ask about isotopes for the millionth time. You've got to get down your isotopes. It's the same element. If it's the same element, it's going to have the same number of protons. The number of protons is called the atomic number because it identifies the type of atom. For instance, carbon. Only carbon has atomic number six, which means only carbon has six protons. So this element, okay, is has 117 protons. They both have 117 protons, okay? But because their mass number is different, 
they have different number of neutrons. So state in terms of both protons and neutrons why they are isotopes of the same element. They have the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons. Or you can be specific. They both have 117 protons, but UUS-294 has one more neutron than UUS. Okay? Again, this idea of isotopes keeps coming up. Iso means same. Okay, same protons, different number of neutrons. Moving on, let's go on to the answer book. And so you could have just said, you just could have said same and different. They would have accepted that. But if, you, if they were specific, okay, you would say 117 because that's the atomic number. And you could have said that UUS294 uh, has one more. Or you could have got the actual number. Of course, to get the actual number, all you need to do is subtract the atomic number from the mass number. But you didn't need to be that specific, okay? But same number of protons, different number of neutrons, all they were looking for, okay? And on to last question of the test, number 85. Number 85, write, complete the nuclear equation in your booklet for the alpha decay by writing a notation for the missing product. So let's go right to the answer booklet, classic part two question. All right, we know nuclear equations actually have a missing amount of mass, but it doesn't ever, ever transfer into losing a neutron or a proton. It's a, it's a fraction of a proton. So we can use the idea of conservation of mass and charge here a little bit. So all the numbers on top on one side of a nuclear equation equal the other. So 294 equals 4 plus what number? So essentially, I'm going to subtract 4 from 294, and I get 290. Okay, now, same thing. All the numbers on the bottom on one side have to equal the numbers on the bottom of the other side. This is 117 on one side, and that equals 2 plus what number? Okay, well, 117 minus 2 would be 115. I can do this. <laughs> okay, all right. So that would be almost it. If you leave it like this, it would be wrong. Now, a lot of people would write this as the answer, 190. Oh, UUS115, and it's wrong because the atomic number has changed, right? So what we need to do, so for 115, we need to find exactly what this element is. Every atom has a unique, uh, what, atomic number. So you needed to go to the periodic table to find out what that symbol is. If you don't have the symbol, you don't get it right, so all we got to do is look. So let's go to the periodic table for 115. And so, 117 gave off two protons and an alpha particle to become 115. So, the symbol is UUP. UUP. Okay? Which actually has a new symbol in the newer reference table, MC. Okay? Um, so, any kids, Moscovium. Moscovium. It's, a, I guess, a Russian element or it was made there. Okay? But... You certainly could use UUP. You didn't have to know MC. The newer uh, reference tables will have that. All right, so UUP works based on your reference table. So the answer is 290 over UUP 115, right? And pretty straightforward, but you have to make sure you've got the right chemical symbol there. A lot of people leave it blank or they just pick the original. Now, this is transmutation. By the way, this is, this is a natural transmutation because by itself, this element okay, is giving off a particle without another particle being forced to hit it. Okay, there's only one reactant. So that concludes this test. Hope you learned something from it, and good luck if you're taking the region soon.